Hello, I am C. You might also know me by my nickname of Charlie. Um, I am one of the newer reference librarians here at the library. Um, if you don't know me, I like funny books and tasty food and trying new things. This video is going to combine all my favorite things into hopefully what is going to be a fun video. Um, I'm honoring my favorite books, my favorite books, by baking recipes in, drawn from or inspired by them. Um, but full disclosure, I don't do much baking. I have watched all of the Great British Baking Show, um, and I love it. But this is going to be a little bit more like nailed it, because um, I am not an expert. And I always improvise and something always goes wrong, because I improvise. More about that later. Um, but because I'm not an expert, I did some research uh, using my librarian skills and I pulled together some baking tips that are supposed to bring more success to baking and I've included that in the recipe packet in case you're like me but you <laughs> aren't comfortable with improvising uh, the way I am. Um, so I will do my best but hopefully we'll all have some fun with this. My goal is to just get nerdy about books and education and have fun being excited about um, trying new things. So hopefully you'll be inspired to try your own bookish bakes or just have fun um, watching me try. So we're gonna start with a simpler recipe <laughs> to give me the best shot of not screwing it up, hopefully. Um, it's drawn from the Terry Pratchett Discworld books. Now, if you don't already know about Terry Pratchett, um, you should give him a try because he was a prolific writer of mostly like satiric fantasy books, which means he sets things in a fantasy world that doesn't take itself too seriously. Um, especially he's really aware of what you're expected to do in like a fantasy book or in a fairy tale, and he loves to turn it on its head and twist it and do something funny with it, which for me is just my sweet spot of uh, what I want out of a book. So if you're into that kind of thing, um, you should definitely try Terry Pratchett. Um, I am going to tell you more about the book that this recipe is drawn from. It appears in several of his long series called the Discworld books. Um, the Discworld books are set in a fantasy universe, uh, a flat disc carried by elephants on the back of a turtle, um, and the turtle is sailing through space. And <laughs> so that's why it's called the Discworld. There are many, many books in this series, and you can read them in order, out of order, in subsets. Um, it's a really clever series, and there's probably something there for everyone. Um, so this one, sort of, this recipe appears in a number of books throughout the series. I'm going to tell you more about the one, the book where I learned about it um, while it's baking, um, because I tried to make a practice batch to use as my ah ta-da but it came out uh, not so good which is just my baking in a nutshell so while it's baking i'm going to tell you more about the book that i got this recipe from um but what the recipe is is it's called dwarf bread um in uh the Discworld books oftentimes people have to go on long complicated journeys um rambling journeys and so they need to take some food on the road and one of the foods they take is dwarf bread. Um, but the thing is, dwarf bread is made by dwarves. It's forged from rocks and meant to be inedible. And so there's this fantastic quote about dwarf bread that I'm going to read to you, um, which comes from the book I'm going to talk about, which is abroad. Um, so this is how they talk about dwarf bread in, in Discworld. <laughs> it was miraculous, the dwarf bread. Uh, no one ever went hungry when they had some dwarf bread to avoid. You only had to look at it for a moment, and instantly you could think of dozens of things you'd rather eat. Your boots, for example. Mountains. Raw sheep. Your own foot. <laughs> so that's that's how they talk about dwarf bread. It's not really supposed to be tasty. Like, you're just meant to have it to, to keep you going and make you think of other things to eat. Um, now, this blog that I got this recipe from, um, I did not come up with this recipe myself. <laughs> I will link to the blog where I got this uh, in the description so that you can check out the other things that they did there. But this blog was trying to put like a more edible twist on dwarf bread instead of actually using rocks, but it's still meant to be sort of true to the same thing, where it's um, hard, crunchy, um, and not something that everybody would find appetizing necessarily. That's my interpretation of this. Um, so 
It's sort of inspired by a fruitcake, but there's no eggs and no milk, so it's pretty flat, pretty crunchy. So we're gonna try and make it, and we'll see how it comes out. Like I say, my practice batch did not go well, um, but it's pretty simple, doesn't take very long, so we can pull it together and see if this one goes better, and then I will test it for you and see if it's um, tasty and edible. So the first thing you wanna do, of course, I'm gonna follow the recipe pretty closely, um, but there's still some interpretation things that I might get wrong, so let's have some fun with that. Um, the first thing it says to do is preheat the oven to 325 degrees, which I feel like is cooler than you normally bake things at. Um, anybody who knows, please drop it in the comments and help me get better at this. So I'm going to preheat my oven here. There we go. Okay. So the oven is preheating. While it's doing that, we start combining our ingredients. And the first thing that I need, get my bowl here, is four and, a, four and one sixth cups of flour. I have never before seen a recipe that asked for a sixth of a cup of flour. So that's my first improvisation right there. I don't know what that means. So I'm going to add like two tablespoons after the four cups. I'm not quite sure. Again, if you know, I would love to have your expertise on this. I have just all purpose flour because it wasn't more specific than that. So I'll get four cups of Two. One of the baking tips you might remember or notice on the sheet is to always measure carefully. Always use a, a kitchen scale or something like that. I don't actually have a kitchen scale. Um, so I don't tend to measure very carefully, which might be why my recipes don't always come out all that well. <laughs> but I'm okay with that. And then... That's four cups, and I'm going to add just another splosh, four and a sixth-ish. So that's the flour, and then you need one cup of sugar. So, again, they weren't terribly specific about types of sugar, so I just have basic granulated sugar for this. I mean, anything with sugar in it can't be too inedible, right? Famous last words. All right, that's not quite a cup because I'm not good at scooping it out of here, so I'll add a little more. Okay, so there's one cup of sugar. And then, baking powder. Again, I have the basic version. Baking powder, you need one tablespoon. my tablespoon measure. So we'll scoop out tablespoon, and I do know you're supposed to level it off, so I'll try and make it flat. Tablespoon of baking powder. And that. And spices. Now this, to me, is the very best part of this recipe because it calls for allspice, cardamom, cinnamon, coriander, ginger, like all the things that make it smell like gingerbread and smell really good. Um, so maybe it's sort of a gingerbread vibe they're going for, I don't know. Um, so it starts with allspice, which I can't find now. There it is. They all look the same. And these are all just a teaspoon each which you get to watch me struggle with these little bottles because I don't, I'm not good at measuring out spices in the best of times and then these little bottles don't wanna let me have it. Some of my favorite um, people who bake uh, online <laughs> are like moms who just don't have time to uh, measure carefully so they tend to just say, measure it with your heart. So if you um, are like me and are struggling with your spices, maybe just measure it with your heart because who has time for struggling with the bottles, right? Uh, I can also link to my favorite people that I that um, post themselves baking. So you could actually see someone who knows what they're doing, uh, which would be a good alternative to, to me doing this. Okay, so that was allspice and this is cardamom. 
which I hope I'm saying right, but I have seen that mostly on the Great British Baking Show. So I know a lot of British pronunciations for spices, but I might not know the American ones. After cardamom, there's cinnamon, which again, how bad can it be if there's cinnamon in it? It's already smelling really good. If you make it, this is probably the point where you're gonna start really enjoying it. And again, I can't get it to come out. So measure it with your heart. That's fine. Cinnamon, then coriander, which I've never used before and maybe never will again, but it's got a cool name. There we go. Now we got it. So, coriander. That's coming out messy. One teaspoon of coriander. And then ginger. There it is. All right, so we'll get the ginger in there. Maybe <laughs> this is going well. Oh, good. The oven is preheated, so whenever I get this stuff figured out, we can get it in the oven. All right, so. Is you're gonna cooperate with me in? Maybe. Measure it with your heart when in doubt. All right, get some ginger in there. And then, nutmeg. I'm gonna just measure it with my heart. All right, nutmeg. And just in case you're wondering, yes, if my mother or grandmother were watching me do this, they would be cringing in horror at how I'm measuring things. But we do our best, right? And the point is to have fun with it. That was cloves, which I needed less of. Shh, I won't tell if you won't. Black pepper I forgot to get out. There it is. This one I should be able to pour. One teaspoon of black pepper, which seems like an odd thing to put into a baking recipe, but if you're going for spices, why not? Okay, so that's all the spices. So then we mix all of these together. Now, when I made my practice batch, I stirred it by hand to try and mix them, and then when I put it out in the pan, it wasn't evenly mixed at all. So I'm gonna try using my mixer for this, which I'm so, uh, poor of a baker or infrequent of a baker that I've never even used this mixer before, but I know how it works because um, I've used it with my mom. So I'm going to try and just mix it up just to get it all evenly combined, I think, so it's not in clumps like it was in my practice batch. you, but I think the KitchenAid mixers are very fancy and very nice because growing up we had one that shuttered its way across the countertop and these are just very calm, very capable, everything I'm not in terms of baking. Alright, so that's mixing up. And then once that's combined, the next thing you add is one and one third cup of dried fruit. Now, the recipe recommended using dried blueberries, cranberries, cherries, dates, or plums for the fruit. Um, but because I improvise whenever I bake, what I have, I do have cherries, dried cherries. I got dried sweetened cherries. And then I have sweetened dried mango, apricots, and pineapple. Because tropical, I guess. So I think it could be good. We're gonna give it a shot. And I'm going to make sure that the dry ingredients are all mixed up first before I try and add anything. And then in order to form it into a dough, which I think is fascinating, we're going to add some maple syrup. Now again, last night in the practice batch, it did not go well. But I think I'm going to use real maple syrup this time, and that should hopefully have more of a binding property than what I tried to use last time. So we'll see. That's been stirring. I'm going to give it a quick stir just to see. Nope, it did not get it all mixed. 
that's the problem. It's not reaching all the way to the bottom of the bowl, I don't think, so all the spices settle, are settling to the bottom. That's my theory. Okay, now, that looks okay, but I thought it looked okay last night, too. So, the dry ingredients are all mixed, and we're going to get a cup and a third of dried fruit. What I'm not sure of is how you're meant to get the same amount of different dried fruits. So again, I'm going to be improvising. I'm gonna start, I have a cup measure and a third of a cup measure since we need one and one thirds cup. So I'm gonna put a little bit of dried cherries in the bottom of each cup and then just make a little layer of the other fruits on top of them. And hopefully that should make it more even. So then we're gonna put apricots, which those look pretty good. They're kind of big maybe, but note to self, if I ever do this again, Chop the dried fruit before <laughs> you put it in your recipe. But uh, some people in the Great British Baking Show like bigger chunks of fruit because you get a nice taste treat when you bite into it. So I think that could be good. Then I'm going to put some dried pineapple in there. Again, biggish chunks, but depending on if we're going for a rustic road trip bread, I think having thick and chunky bits of fruit could be nice. This isn't exactly a patisserie they're talking about. French bakery. And then the dried mango. Now, I did try and use this last in my practice batch also. And pieces are really big for these. So these ones I actually will cut down a little bit because they actually do make it look unappetizing when you come across just one of these lying on top of it. So I'm going to chop it a little bit, and also it'll fit in the cup better if I do. And when I say chop, I mean hack at it <laughs> with probably the wrong knife. But uh, so long as it's smaller, that's what I'm going for. Now, put that in there. And that is roughly a cup and a third. This, again, probably you would measure it on a kitchen scale to do it the right way. Uh, I am not doing that but I think it'll come out okay anyway, maybe. So then we're gonna stir that in. Mix in dried fruit, it says. Again, you probably want it evenly distributed, but I don't know how you control that. I'm just gonna stir it so that it's not all clumped on the top. And then it vanishes into the flour, where it really feels like too much flour, like maybe that's just me. Okay, we're gonna put in the maple syrup now and stir it in until a uniform dough forms. I don't know if you're meant to be stirring while you pour it in, like some recipes seem to want you to pour in the flour a bit at a time and keep stirring it. It doesn't say that, it just says stir it in until a uniform dough forms. So I'm just gonna pour it all in at once because I only have two hands and then just stir it up after that. <laughs> Any real bakers out there cringing at this point? That's pretty much everything out of there. Now, for the record, the amount of maple syrup that it called for was one and one thirds cup of maple syrup. But I just bought a package of maple syrup that was 8.5 fluid ounces. And I am not a math person, I'll be the first one to tell you that. But my interpretation of one cup is eight ounces. So eight and a half ounces with a little bit gone would probably be about a cup and a third. Um, don't, don't come for me. Just educate me. Uh, if you actually know better, please uh, help me with this. Help me get better at this. Um, but I'm going to stir it in and see. Now in my practice batch, it got crumbly. Like it wasn't just powder anymore. It was like crumbles, but it wasn't what I would call a uniform dough. I don't know if it was the kind of flour I used or how I stirred it in, but it didn't really make a dough and that seems to be happening again. But again, maybe I'm supposed to be using a mixer for this. Only I don't think you'd want the dried fruit in it if you're gonna use a mixer for that. I feel like I'm on the Great British Baking Show doing a technical challenge right now, but this is not a technical challenge. You're just stirring things together, but I still don't know what I'm doing. So, uh, so yes, this is, but to be fair, isn't that the best part of the show when they're all struggling to figure out the technical challenge and you see who can do it and who can't? Now, I got to this point last night too. I'm trying to stir it. It's kind of stiff. There's a lot of it. 
and I'm not really seeing a uniform dough form. So when in doubt, me personally, I just stick my hands in it and stir with my hands because I'm not as good at using a, a tool to do it. So I'm gonna put this down and just try to combine it with my hands, um, which is interpreting stir a little loosely, I think, but it might help or it might not. <laughs> it's not making a dough at all. <laughs> this, is, this is why it's fun to try things because you're like, I don't understand why it's not working. Um, <laughs> I don't know nearly enough to know why this isn't doing what it's supposed to do. You can sort of clutch it together, but it doesn't stick together. Which to me means there's not enough liquid. Um, I had this once before. My sister and I were trying to make Christmas cookies. And it was all powdery and it wasn't making a dough at all. And so we just added double the milk to it. And that actually made it into a thing. Unfortunately, I didn't get enough maple syrup for that. So I can't actually add more liquid to it because I'm pretty sure that was all gone. Almost. Ew. Shake it out. <laughs> and now I'm gonna get my hands all sticky because there's fresh maple syrup in there. Come on, baby, make a dough. I have comments on this recipe. Not very intuitive. Although I guess they figure you know how to bake. Uh, okay. You know what? That might very well be the best I can do. <laughs> Which I will see how it comes out. And uh, maybe you can do better. Please do. So that's as combined as I can get it. Now, the next step is to line a cookie sheet with parchment paper and spread the dough evenly in the pan. And the dough should be thin. You're going for a very thin layer, apparently. Uh, but I don't have parchment paper either, mind you. So I never have had parchment paper. I don't really understand why you need it. Like if you put it under pies, you're just gonna get paper with your pies. So I don't totally get what parchment paper is for. Um, but what I do have is aluminum foil. And when I made my practice batch, that was the one thing that did seem to work decently well, was putting the um, foil on it instead of parchment paper. So again, if you know why parchment paper would be better, please, please share. Um, I would be very curious to know, actually. So I'm gonna take my cookie sheet and I'm gonna line it with aluminum foil. And then I'm gonna spray the foil so that the dough doesn't stick to it. take non-stick spray. Again, there might be a better way to do this. My mom always swore by Crisco, but I think Crisco's gross, so I can't bear to have it in my house. So I have my cookie sheet all prepped and uh, spread the dough evenly. It's going to turn into pour it in and pat it down, which is sort of like the shortbreads I would make with my mom as a kid. Um, only that was even, that was still more combined than this because this is just a mound of powdery stuff. That's totally what I was going for. I'd be so curious if I would be so curious to have a real baker make this and show me this is what it's supposed to do. Um, I'm so skeptical that it's too much flour though, like too much flour and not enough liquid. That's my suspicion. Or potentially I misinterpreted how much a cup was and so I didn't put nearly enough maple syrup in it. That's also possible. All right, so spread the dough evenly has turned into pat down the powder, powdery mess into a flat rectangle shape. So it is now a flat rectangle shape and we're gonna put it in the oven. I'm not sure this is even, but I don't know how you make it even either. We're gonna put it in the oven and bake it until golden brown or about 35 minutes. So I'm gonna put this in here. I also know that it matters whether you put it on the top rack or the middle rack of the oven, but this doesn't actually specify. So I'm just gonna put it on the top and see what happens. I'll set my little kitchen timer 
for 35 minutes and we'll see what it looks like at that point. Now, I'm very curious to see how that comes out. <laughs> I don't know about you. So while I clean up my workstation, we're gonna wait for that to bake. And so I have a couple of housekeeping things to tell you while that's baking. Um, number one, thank you all very much for coming along with me on this journey of improvisation and attempting to bake things. But if you can do better, or you think you can, which you, you probably can, please make it yourself and send us a picture, the library, of your version of this and how it came out. Um, you could post it on social media and tag us. You could email it to us. Like, send us your version of this because I would love to see how someone who knows what they're doing would actually do this. Um, if you do that, if you send it to us and tag us in social media posts or whatever, um, we will enter you in a giveaway because the next recipe I'm going to make is honey cakes inspired by Winnie the Pooh, which I think they're gonna be adorable. I'm not sure I can do it well, but I think they're gonna be adorable. So that takes a special pan to do that, to make them come out and look like beehives. So we don't want you to have to go out and buy that pan if you're never gonna do this again. So if you make this recipe and share your results um, with us, we will enter you in a giveaway and one lucky viewer will get a free beehive pan to make the second recipe with. Um, so hopefully that will be a fun time. Uh, so make sure to share your results of this one with us. And I promise I will do research and practice and try and be better at this before I make the honey cakes. Um, so that hopefully they come out better. Because Winnie the Pooh is my whole childhood and I just can't bear to think that I would let him down. But again, so long as there's a bunch of honey in it, I think Winnie the Pooh would approve, right? All right, so make sure to enter the giveaway by making this recipe. You don't have to eat it. You could literally just bring it and say, this is for C because I will not eat this. Um, let me tell you more about dwarf bread and where I learned about it. Um, dwarf bread first appeared to me in the Terry Pratchett book, Witches of Broad. This is my copy of it. Um, it is a really fun book because it shows off everything Terry Pratchett knows how to do about taking a trope or an expectation and then turning it on its head like, and we're not gonna do that, or at least making it really funny. So in Witches Abroad, um, three witches, a mismatched bunch, have to go on a long journey to stop an evil witch um, who's trying to make this little town into a fairy tale paradise. So she's forcing the issue into the servant girl is gonna marry the prince and there's a frog prince and all that jazz. So she's forcing all these fairy tale tropes because she thinks that that's what a good story is. So the whole book is always talking about what a story is and how a story works and how you can derail a story and how it has to fulfill its, its destiny and all things like that. So that's really clever. And then there's all kinds of tropes that he's taking, like the magic mirror appears in this book and the three witches, um, who are absolutely fantastic and hilarious, are uh, Granny Weatherwax, who is um, like a more of a crone figure, like a single old woman who's crotchety and grouchy. And like um, the best thing about her is that she has her broomstick that they fly on. Her broomstick will not start unless you run really fast up and down with it, like which makes for hilarity and trying to start her broom um, in odd circumstances. So she's the the crone of the three of them. And then there's Nanny Og, who is very warm and matronly. She's the mother of the... I feel like there's a, a thing that's the maiden, the mother, and the crone. That's kind of the trope they're going for, assuming I'm right that that's a thing. So Nanny Og has a bunch of kids. She's actually, like, she's a motherly figure, but because this is Pratchett, he makes her like a vaguely sensual figure too. Um, so she's, she's funny, and she doesn't really take Granny Weatherwax too seriously. She's like, yeah, you get crotchety. We've been friends for a long time. I'm not worried about you. Um, and then they're traveling with the maiden figure, and that's Magret, Magrat. I think if I had a British accent, that would sound better. Um, Garlic. And she's this young girl who's like unsure of herself. She really wants to be a good witch. She's trying to have progressive ideals about it, of course. Um, and she's trying to learn how to use the magic wand. Like they've been bequeathed a magic wand. This is mine, homemade magic wand from a Harry Potter event. Um, and if you really wanted to know, I could show you how I made this. 
Um, so she's trying to learn to use the magic wand. She's, but she's unsure of herself. She's insecure. And the only thing she can get the wand to do is turn things into pumpkins. Like she has very little skill with the wand. And so that becomes a source of hilarity throughout the book too. Um, so they're going on this journey and they always have dwarf bread with them, but they don't want to eat that. So they're always going into little towns and eating with them. Anyway, it's just really funny. It's really good satire. Um, and there's even a Lord of the Rings reference. If you are reading carefully, there is a Lord of the Rings reference and completely lampoon in Terry Pratchett style. I am so nerding out about this book. It's so fun. It's everything I ever wanted out of a book. So that's what that book is about. Um, please give it a try if you like witches, fairy tales, and funny twists on things and satire, and especially tongue-in-cheek British humor. There's a lot of that. It's uh, my favorite thing in the world. So. I am going to skip ahead a little bit so you guys don't have to sit here and watch me wait for this to finish baking. Um, we will be right back to see the final result of my improvisational attempt at dwarf bread. Don't go away. Okay, we're back. The timer just went off. Um, it's all done baking. So let's see. This is very exciting. Let's see whether it actually came out like a thing or not, huh? Okay. Get my hot pads. <laughs> it just looks like the desert. It looks like the Sahara Desert. That's what it looks like. Uh. Oh, that does not look appetizing, does it? Look at that. But see, I can't decide. I can't decide. Is that better? Or is that worse than what my practice batch looks like? Which is like this. See, it's darker. And this looks a lot grainier because I used whole wheat flour, I think. So maybe that's, I don't know. So is that better or worse? I don't know. So uh, the recipe said slice while it's still warm. What does that mean? I don't know. It's fresh out of the oven right now. Is it too early to slice? Maybe. It also doesn't say how. So I think it's sort of up to you what shape and size you want of these things. I sort of just made a grid for the first one. Because I imagine these as like squares, roughly the size, um, that you can stack and carry in your bag easily if you're traveling on the road, right? So I'm gonna make slices across in sort of a tic-tac-toe grid. It is just crumbling, in case you're wondering. It's sort of slicing, but there's lots of powder around the edges. So I do not think this made a dough, so to speak. I'm very curious, as it cools, to see if it holds together. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not holding my breath. That is how I cut it. I like the grid. I'm going to see, out of curiosity, if I can get a piece out, because I would love to do a taste test, especially a taste test comparison, but it might just crumble into dust. Let's find out. So for our taste test, we're gonna have my practice batch, the very dark slice of desert, but it does feel sort of gooey. This one, I don't know. We'll see. Let's see if I can't get maybe this side piece. Ooh, that's warm, that's warm. All right, so I got a little piece here. Very pale, dusty desert. Ta-da. So let's see if this is uh, something you'd rather eat your own foot or not. I'm going to break off a smaller piece of this. <laughs> maybe. Well, that's interesting. I'm getting the spices, actually. Like, it's very dusty, but it's surprisingly chewy. It's not just powder in your mouth. Maybe that is what it was supposed to be. Interesting. I still don't think I'd eat it, like, by choice, a lot. 
but it's not bad. Better than I expected. It doesn't just taste like flour. There's sweetness and there's spices, and you get little bits of the dried fruit as you hit it. Okay, sweet. That actually did roughly come out. Okay. So, I'm not a baker, as you have seen, um, but I'm proud of this. You know, you know, I tried a new thing. I was inspired by a book. I got to just be nerdy and happy about one of my favorite books. And I have something that I can eat and share with people. So, I'm proud of me. If you try this, even if it comes out like this, um, I hope you're proud of yourself. Please send us your results if you do try this. And uh, tune in next time to see Honey Cakes inspired by Winnie the Pooh. We will announce the winner of the giveaway, um, depending on how quickly um, entries come in, but we will announce the winner of the giveaway so that you can get the beehive pan to try it for yourself. So have a fantastic day and happy reading, happy baking.